Welcome to Smash Avo Property. Today I'm speaking with Todd Sloan, and this dude is an absolute legend. We've got a cracking conversation coming up as Todd walks us through his incredible story. Not only is his life journey super inspiring, he's also kind enough to walk us through his investing journey, exposing warts and all. Yeah, it was one of those ones that was actually all, all my money on that one, but you, you live and you learn. So that was something that definitely taught me a, a good lesson. You'll have to listen in to hear that story. As always, seek your own professional financial, legal, taxation, and property investing advice for your current situation. Everything we talk about is just our opinion and general in nature and should never be considered as personal advice. This episode is brought to you by pricefinder.com.au, one of the most comprehensive property data providers in Australia. As part of the domain group, Pricefinder collects detailed property data from multiple sources so you don't have to, including property ownership, phone numbers, property zoning, over 30 years of sales and rental history, and real-time listing and auction results. You can also purchase the title certificates on their platform if you need to. Pricefinder has a feature called Property Scout. It's designed especially for investors to find development opportunities by searching properties by zoning and land size. Pricefinder also has a great interactive mapping tool that makes your search easier and faster. So without any further ado, let's get house hunting with Todd. Todd Sloan, welcome to Smash Over Property. Thanks, Jordan. Thanks for having me, man. Mate, it is an absolute pleasure. I'm super keen to talk to you today. You're our first real estate agent and we've had plenty of buyers agents on and plenty of younger guys who are like cracking into the industry and we haven't had a real estate agent before. So I'm pretty keen to have a chat to you and, and talk about not only what you're doing, what you're up to, but your portfolio and everything else like that. But how have you been anyway? Yeah, pretty good, man. I'm, I'm glad that you guys have decided to, to cross over to the dark side and talk to someone <laughs> on the, the sales side of things. Uh, but, but yeah, go, going very well at the moment, mate. Um, the market's ticking along nicely here in, uh, in South Australia. We're actually finding, like uh, you and I were just having a, a talk a little while ago about listings are, are down a bit. I think, 50, no, what was it 30%? I think it was the official figure, but otherwise sales are kicking along quite well. Yeah, that's phenomenal. It's, it's great to see that there's still, I think we were, we were talking about this beforehand as you said but it, it seems like you know demand may be coming down but supply is coming down faster than demand so that that demand level is pretty consistent and that's why you're seeing you know these sales still tick along quite heavily while you know the stock's kind of drying up a little bit or there's not as much stock on as there were beforehand but um it, it's good to see some sort of positivity out of this sort of a market i mean it's it's easy for us to see the headlines of negative 10, negative 20, negative 30% drop to the property market. But realistically, when you've got your boots on the ground and you're seeing sales go through the doors like you are, it's pretty phenomenal. Um, mm, so why don't, you give, why don't you give us a little bit of background about, you know, your sort of education, how old you are, where you're currently working and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, no worries, man. I'm so, uh, all right, where do I start? Um, I actually started uh, diamond drilling underground in a, a mine actually up in uh, Roxby in South Australia. I um, started doing that. I remember Steve McKnight's book was one of the, the first books I read. That was zero to 260 properties. Um, I was always fascinated with, with real estate because um, there's just something about it, the, the tangible side of things. I really liked it opposed to, to the share side. I um, just found that yeah, you don't really have much to, to play with with this actual stock certificate. But I'm not to say that shares are bad, just didn't really click with me. But I ended up buying my first investment when I was 21. And it's the classic story of did everything wrong. So I, I bought with my heart, not with my head. It was a, an apartment because I'd, I'd always just fantasized when I was younger about living in this building. And it was uh, the, the actual the Oaks Embassy building. Right? So it was a hotel that I'd bought into and lived there for, for seven years and rented it out for a few. But it just didn't really grow. Like it, it did all right. I bought it for, I think, 280 sold it for 350 But I actually actually ended up having an accident on a drill rig and had uh, three bulging discs between my T6 and T11 and two facet joints out of place. Um, so that actually pretty much cut me out of the mining industry completely. And I actually couldn't walk properly for almost four years. So I went into a, a pretty bad space in my life. So that was all pretty much through my kind of early to, to late twenties, I think from about, yeah, 24 to, to around sort of 28. Um, until that guy actually got fixed end up doing some pretty intense physio after some cortisol injections and sort of took it in a whole different direction after that because i wasn't allowed back on a drill rig uh walking was one of the best things physios told me to do for my back so i actually ended up walking from adelaide to melbourne uh for for charity did that and um then started in real estate and i couldn't work out why every agency that i applied for 
that they didn't want to talk about like my passion for property. Didn't want to talk about that at all. They just wanted to talk about walking from Adelaide to Melbourne. And I couldn't figure it out. I'm thinking this has nothing to do with real estate. About a year in, I figured it out because all they were looking for is someone that actually had determination, someone that could could actually persevere because property sales is definitely not what I thought it would be. And it's probably not what a lot of people might think it is. So after, yeah, after selling, it, it took a little while to really find my feet on the sales side because the selling of houses, totally fine with. The thing that I didn't really click with straight away was the selling myself part. I always had such a problem with the the image of the the chest beating real estate agent walking in saying, I'm so amazing, sign up with me. And and it really just didn't click with me. And it was probably about actually took me ages, probably a good sort of year and a half, two years before it clicked. I started really taking more of a consultative approach with people and and talking them through the passions that I had and the knowledge that I had around real estate. And, and actually just have, having a real approach of, okay, so this is where you are now. This is where you want to go. Let's talk about how to get you there. And that's, that's really one of the things that's, that's turned it around for me, I think. Mate, that's a, an incredible story. It's a lot of background and a, and a lot of uh, struggle, it sounds like, that has gone into your journey. And what I love about you becoming a real estate agent is you've gotten into it because of the passion for property, it sounds like. And I think you know, some real estate agents get in just for the sales and the commission and, and the lifestyle. But I think, you, you know, your passion's really driven that that career move and that career change. As, as you said, they were looking for determination in, in your story rather than, you know, your investing history and what you know about property and all the rest of it. So um, pretty phenomenal story there, mate. And was was the first property looked at as an investment or was it just, oh, I've got to live in this, in this block of uh, a hotel that I really want to? Yeah, no, not an investment at all. Like if I if I'm a hundred percent transparent with that, mate, it was actually bought to impress a girl at the time. Um, <laughs> I later found out that I could have just rented a room in the hotel. Probably would have been a smarter, smarter investment. Um, but yeah, girl, girl at the time, she was actually from Melbourne, um, and I remember thinking, oh, I gotta gotta have a cool place to live when she comes down. Um, yeah, so I ended up buying. I mean, I wanted it anyway. That's just kind of the footnote of it. But um, yeah, definitely not not chosen on the numbers. And as far as the actual rental yields were concerned, we're still good on that side of things. I paid to 281 to be exact for it. And I used to actually rent it back to the Oaks Group for I think it was 505 or for around $500 a week. So that, that looks amazing on, on the front of it. But as soon as you take out the strata cost and everything else and the, the runnings of it, not, not as good when we're talking net return versus gross rental return. Yeah, for sure. And I guess, you know, it's all part of that, that learning journey for you and kind of keen to hear what has happened since then and what you've been doing. I mean, you've got some phenomenal renovation videos on YouTube that we'll, we'll delve into as well, but I'm keen to hear how your strategy and, and how that sort of changed and tapered your views on property moving forward. But if we go back just to, to young Todd, I mean, what, I mean, for me, it was Steve Bignice book as well. Like that really got me into the, in the mindset of investing in property, but was there anything talked about in the household? You know, was money talked about? I mean, where did you sort of get that investing fundamental from? I think it was probably born from the, the exact opposite of that as money really wasn't talked about that much in the household. Um, so it didn't, didn't grow up like on, on the poverty line as such, um, but, but definitely didn't grow up with, with money, that's for sure. Like I, so I was a, a little kid, um, always uh, pretty, pretty good on saving side of things. And I still remember when I was about 10 years old, I'd always have a few hundred dollars in my savings, even though I'm only getting uh, $2 a week pocket money because everything was just about what could I do? Could I like weed the garden, knocking on the next door neighbors, uh, mowing the lawns for them, just doing whatever I could. And I think it came more so out of the fact of not wanting to live that life when I was older. I knew that from a very young age that I, I didn't want to scrape by. And, and watching my mum work so hard, like she's a single mum, she was cleaning houses, but still actually saving enough to like take us uh, away to, to Melbourne. One year she took us to, to Queensland. Uh, and it wasn't because she was doing so well. It was because she was so diligent. So as much as she wasn't teaching me investing, fundamentals I think she taught me really the fundamentals of the saving side of things and then it was really just in later years when I realized it's only the first step it really needs to then knock on to step number two which is where am I going to put this money and that's probably where we 
click into where we left off beforehand or started with Steve McKnight and learning more about real estate and, and really what it could do. Yeah, 100%. It sounds like you've really learned what the value of money is compared to just getting into investment because you have to and property grows. You you understand what money can bring and, and what both sides of the spectrum look like or at least what one side of the spectrum look like and then finding a way to, to get to the other side of the, of the spectrum. But yeah, mate, that's a, that's a, that's a really cool journey, a really cool uh, way of, of looking at it. Um, and, and do you think that was kind of the hardest part is like learning, learning those concepts and learning the value of money or, or was there something else that was were hard to get you through and, and, and how did you go about saving for that first deposit? So the first deposit, that was, um, yeah, see, again, I, I, I don't really know how to describe this one because it was, it was just because I was working in the mines, earning pretty reasonable money and mm. I just basically put everything away. So it, it came from there. And when I say reasonable money, I still wasn't on like just again for transparency. It wasn't like I was on 300 grand a year. I think when I was like 21, I was probably on about 90. So because I was only a, not even a diamond driller then. I was actually a, an offsider. So it's, it's reasonable money, but we're still not talking like cashed up to the hilt. Okay. And looking back on it, probably still wasted a little bit too much of it in younger years. But <laughs> it was really just about putting as much away as I could. And then just getting in, I think even I was pretty highly leveraged. The first one it was like a 95.5 LVR. Oh. But again, I just thought I'd rather just get in now than, than sit on the sidelines. And so getting back to it, my first investment really, like I said, I pretty much did everything wrong that you could. <laughs> yeah, I'm sort of uh, going down the list as you're, as you're reeling out the story and saying, yep, 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 yep. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> um, but I that's all. the plan was the only thing I didn't have in there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, you, yeah. you got the apartment building in. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's yeah. that's part of you know what I wanted to get out of this podcast as well is is talking about people's mistakes and you know I, I really thank you for the listeners and for myself for being really transparent about it because you know a lot of people that we get on sort of only share the good stories or only share the good properties and it's and it's nice to to hear you know some of the mistakes so that other people can learn from them and and try and not make the same mistakes and so do you think you know how you said you were living in that for seven years did you make any other investments between when you purchased that and seven years down the track did you sort of you said you you, you went through a bit of a, a down period in yourself was is it was the investing completely off the cards there and then picked up at a, at a later stage or um, how does that sort of journey look yeah so it spiked up then uh, fell apart then got picked back up again so it really was like the the dark sort of period for me though those kind of mid to late 20s so bought a development site actually in a regional town in um in victoria so actually in, in horsham um had everything set for that to, to knock down the house um unfortunately then went through a relationship breakdown and uh, ended up having to give that to to her um, which was frustrating uh, because, mm. yeah, it was one of those ones that was actually all, all my money on that one. But you, you live and you learn. So that was something that, that definitely taught me a, a good lesson on that side of things. But it probably wasn't until I was around, I reckon, 30 was when, and this is what I mean, but I've definitely started later. So I'm 34 now and probably about 30 years old was when it sort of just clicked and went, I've really got to be more active in this and start taking this more seriously. So I ended up selling my apartment because I looked at it and thought, this, this isn't going anywhere. Like for, for what I want to do, long, long term, I think it'll probably do all right. Short to long term, no, I didn't, I didn't believe in that at all. But for me though, and this is one of the things I always stress to people, it's not always about right or wrong and good and bad. It's about what are you actually trying to achieve? And I couldn't renovate it. I couldn't subdivide it. I couldn't develop it. I couldn't actually add any value to that thing. So that the lady that I actually ended up selling it to, she didn't want to do any of that. She just wanted something she didn't have to think about and just had a high yield to it. So for her, perfect. Ticked all the boxes. But for me, it was time to get rid of it. It was time to sink my teeth into something that I could actually add some value to. Now, one of the things I was concerned about I'd never actually renovated before apart from helping friends. I'd, I'd worked on a lot of other projects as far as like helping my little brother out, helping some, some friends and family, but I'd never actually done like a full house start to finish. So I actually got some advice from actually a family member saying, start with something that's on that lower end to just in case if it goes wrong, because this is when I just got into to real estate sales as well. So when you start in sales, you're on a retainer. For anyone that doesn't understand, 
retain a basically minimum wage. Okay. And then whenever you get a commission, if you go negative, you then have to pay that back. So you, you're not exactly on great money when you start in real estate. Okay. So I knew that I had to do this on, on the cheap basically, but it was a fundamentals thing. So from the beginning, I knew I wasn't going to earn hundreds of thousands out of it. So I bought a, a house that had actually been trucked onto a site and then they went bankrupt. So there was no water connected, no power connected, no septic tank, no nothing. And I ended up getting everything connected. I oh, sorry, paid 62,500 for, for the site. Okay, originally, I think they wanted 80 something for it. Uh, so I got them down to 62,500 and probably paid, I think, around, around 35 to get everything done. And just recently got that revowed again at 150. So it wasn't about big numbers, but it was just about making sure that I understood so much more about the process, about putting a reno plan together, about dealing with councils, about dealing with power, um, about actually getting things installed. And if it all fell apart, I was carrying a $60,000 mortgage. It was like, okay, I just won't have coffee this week. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't like I was going backwards like $500,000 a week. It was pretty straightforward if everything went belly up. And that, that really gave me the confidence, I think, to take a bit more risk with it and, and to really sort of jump forward and do things that maybe I wouldn't do if I was doing my first project at like a half a million or million set point. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. You, you learn so much along the way. And if you can do it at a minimal risk with only, you know, carrying that much debt, then, you know, why not take a little bit of a, a gamble, but it's not a massive gamble and learn the ropes as you go. And even I, you know, I've learned a ton from your renovation, renovation videos on YouTube. And, you know, I think, you being able to share that journey with other people and being completely transparent about all the mistakes and, and the lessons and the learnings is, is fundamentally helpful as well. Not only are you learning yourself, you're teaching other people and probably, you know, uh, remembering or, or looking over all the mistakes that you did make and learning even more from it. So I think that's, that's crazy. And I think that I love that you've changed from not that you were initially a passive investor. You kind of just uh, purchased that apartment to live in it, but now you've transitioned to a pretty active, active investor and trying to uh, grab everything by the horns and, and, and increase your, your, your growth and your income and create manufacture equity and, and everything else along the journey. And I think, is that part of what your, your goal is for investing moving forward? Yeah, definitely. And like in those earlier years, like if I'm honest enough for myself and I've had lots of like personal growth and self-discovery, I was just scared. And I didn't want to admit that because no one wants to actually say that to themselves. But I really think that's what held me back in those, those kind of earlier years. And, and since then, like the, the walk, and I'm not prescribing saying everyone should walk to Melbourne, but the walk to Melbourne, that was really something that just something impossible. Because then like, I've, I've actually just done that. And, and then it really just set the stage for just every other aspect of my life of what else can I do? And, and now I'm, I'm probably one of the most determined people you'll ever meet. And it's just a, a, a real sense of, focus on what I want and, and then how am I going to get there and just do everything I can. And there's going to be things that come in your way and that's fine. There's always going to be problems, but as long as you've got that, that vision of where you want to go and that work ethic and determination, I think, I think I've already strayed from your question. So I'm going off topic here, Jordan. <laughs> but the thing for me that I think is the most important thing, if you're listening to this and you're just not sure, you've got to find that belief because I think belief is the most powerful thing. So one of my favorite sayings is that Henry Ford one. And, and it's actually funny, on, on my podcast, um, the lady that I interviewed just yesterday said, it, if you believe you can or if you believe you can't, either way you're right. And it's easy to just kind of throw that away as like some kind of a cool like quote that Henry Ford said like in 1920 or whenever he did. But it's totally true. It really is true. And, and if, if you can really give yourself that belief and, and manufacture however you need to, I just think that that changes everything. But oh, anyway, I really have strayed from your question there. No, no, Jordan, that's sorry, mate. I think, I think, well, no, it's, it's great because I think, you know, uh, I've been fortunate enough to be invited on your podcast and we've had a, a couple of discussions of, of mindset and, you know, setting your, your day up and miracle mornings and, you know, just embracing life as much as you can. And I think we're kind of on that, that same wave, wavelength and that's where we get our passion and our drive from. And, and I love that, you know, you've constantly got this, um, you know, backing of, of pushing yourself and, and enjoying your life and getting the most that you can and even talking of your podcast you know I remember you uh, talking one time about your renovation project and how you know sometimes you struggled to, to 
delve into it and find the time and, and get everything. But what you did was just go there for half an hour every day. It doesn't matter what you're doing, if you're moving rubbish around or getting into something, but you might get into something for half an hour and then end up staying for an hour or two hours. And, you know, it just mm -hmm. proves to the point that, you know, it doesn't matter if you can't find time in your day, you can always find half an hour on the way home to scooch by and do something. And I think that just really reinforces... 100%. Your drive moving forward, but yeah, I think the the question was is is that a part of your investing goal? Are you constantly going to be a renovator now, or um, what's the sort of game plan look for in the future? Yeah, I really think renovation is going to be where I'll I'll stay. Um, I actually just had a, a meeting then with a couple of clients that they're from from Sydney. They were talking about uh, they invest in Bondi. Actually, Chris Gray is actually their their buyer's agent. Great guy if you've never heard of Chris. Um, and and they were talking about the returns and how passive it is. But now they're coming over here to renovate because they they want to to be able to manufacture. I think for for me, it's probably going to be a mix of both long term but for now definitely in that hands-on renovate i, I want to find something that can go brilliant how do i make an extra 50 100 grand in the next sort of two three four months out of that whereas and maybe it comes from a little bit of impatience like one of my biggest pet hates is people that stand in front of me on the escalator i just hate it it's just <laughs> like that's what i loved about london if you want to stand that's fine but stand on the left or the right, whichever one it is and I think I'm a little bit the same with my, my investing with property. And it's not to say I just like eyes closed, head first, can't lose kind of attitude. You have to do due diligence. But I want to get into something and go, brilliant, how do I make this actually work? And what can I do to make it work even better and faster? And, and does that make sense? Oh, 100%. Uh, totally. Um, yeah, I think you, that, that transition to active investing and, and just wanting to do as much as you possibly can uh, to, to, I don't know, I don't know, are you trying to earn as much as you can? Is there an end goal? Like, do you want to have a certain amount or are you just enjoying the ride? Just, just enjoying the ride. The, part of the end goal would definitely be the passive income side of things. Yeah. I definitely want to be able to have work as an option. Like, I'm, I'm totally a workaholic and, and I think that's a good thing if you love what you do if you hate what you do and you're a workaholic change direction that's that's just a way to slowly kill yourself from the inside out but i really love what i do and, and i think being able to then let's say have 100 grand a year whatever it is uh, as a passive income coming in works an option it's not a have to that that's very attractive to me i like that yeah, yeah, that's perfect. And since that uh, original renovation, have you done a couple more? I mean, maybe you don't have to tell them more, but how many have you done and, and maybe your, success, your most successful deal? Yeah, yeah. So I've done a, another one where I bought it for, for one, 110, uh, spent nine grand on it, got it revowed. Uh, I think it was just under 170, 165 for memory. Wow. Um, so again, not, not huge amounts, but did well out of that. Uh, the most recent one, I'm actually going to release all the numbers. I've got to make the full breakdown video for this, but I don't mind sharing them with you guys now. I bought it for, for 215, spent 30 on it, and just got it revowed for 340. So, Man, that these, is the 80ish out of that. These aren't oh, bad numbers. The, the, you've done very well out of these ones. And it sounds like you're, you're getting uh, bigger and bigger and bigger as you go. Is that, is that the confidence? Yeah, I, I think a little bit of that. Um, but I also think it's just, it's about finding the deal. Every time I've bought somewhere, people always say, oh, what do you think about that area? I'm like, well, the area is part of it, of course. Um, if I was going to be completely passive, the area would be everything. Yeah, but because I'm, I'm active in it as well, the area is kind of in the back seat where what's in the front seat is the initial numbers for the deal. Like the, you, you could show me a, a property uh, where there's an area where I don't think, okay, like out, out north, let's say in like um, Elizabeth, lower socioeconomic area here in South Australia. It's kind of like, yeah, your Mount Druid equivalent. I don't know what you guys have got in Melbourne, um, but I, I don't really see massive things happening. And maybe I'm wrong, but I don't really see massive things happening there. But if you showed me a deal where I could buy it for, for 120 grand, spend 10 grand on it and get it revowed for 180, I would be interested in that. It just it, to me, I'd look at that and go, well, that, that makes sense. The numbers stack up. Now, even if that property doesn't move and explode and, and all of a sudden double in value in the next 10 years, if I've got an asset that's enabled me to move on to the next one, because that's always what I want to look for. If it pulls me away or if it caps my serviceability, not interested at this stage. Maybe later, but not at this stage. I want to be able to pull out enough equity to then move on to the next project but then keep that asset as well, but keep it in a way that it's not costing me $100 a week. It's either positively geared or neutrally geared. So I can just keep building this portfolio. And this is where I, I do kind of stray from the pack a little bit like this. 
And I, I could be wrong. I could have egg on my face in 10 years' time and everyone else has completely surpassed me. But I look at it and think, if, if I've got a portfolio that's made up of more properties that are still in reasonable locations, I'm not talking about buying in towns that have got populations of 500 or anything like that, but it's still in reasonable locations. But if I can actually stretch myself, let's say, to get 20 or 30, opposed to capping out at, at three or four or five, to me, that just makes more sense. And, and again, this is what I mean. It's, it's a personal thing. In no way is this advice. It's just, it's what works for me and where I want to take things. For sure. And I think, you know, everyone's kind of got their own plan and their own strategy. And I think, you, you know, that, I mean, this kind of environment has really dawned it on me. Like I was, I was pretty, pretty strong armed for, for capital growth and I still am, but this sort of environment has really showed me how important cash flow is. Like if you, if you've got all these really strong capital growth properties, but they're all negatively geared and then you lost your job, well, you can't afford to hold on to them. And thankfully we've had mortgage repayments and all that sort of stuff. But if we didn't, you'd probably have to sell them. And so this sort of environment has really shown me how important having that sort of diversified portfolio is. And I think, you know, that's the kind of approach that you're going for. If, if, if you've got the property scattered along all these different areas and, you know, you've got all these different strategies being implemented with renovation and, um, you know, manufacturing equity and, and all this stuff along the way, I think, you know, it's not like you're, um, you're doing the wrong thing. It's just the way that you've gone about it. And it's, and it's your interpretation of how you want to build your portfolio. And I think, you know, we've had a, a pretty diverse group of people on here. We've got people with, you know, two, two properties in their portfolio and it's worth, they're worth $4 million. And then we've got others that have got 20 properties in their portfolio and it's worth $4 million. I think it's just the, the way that you've gone about it. And I think, you know, it's great to get the other opinions and, and other ways of investors are, are doing it. Um, and so, I mean, that probably uh, answers most of the next question that I was going to ask you, which is how do you assess the investment potential of a property? And I think you've kind of covered most of the ground there, except for maybe one thing. I mean, what do you look for in terms of, a, of doing a renovation? Are you trying to find complete dumps? Are you trying to find, you know, things that you, you could do in the backyard? I mean, what do you look out for when you're, when you're looking for a property to renovate? Yeah, it's pretty much everything that I tell my clients to do when I'm selling a home. Uh, selling a home, I look for the opposite. So I'll, I'll always say like presentation, it's, it's got to be paramount. We've got to have, uh, it's, it's called a disconnection between the head and the heart. Okay. So if you're looking at this as an investor, which I'm assuming you are, if you're listening to this podcast, you're going to be making decisions with your head. Okay. Now when you sell later on, you want to make sure that you're selling to someone that's making their decisions with their heart. If you can get someone to fall in love with the property, that's a lot of the time when you can start pushing that figure up and up and up. Okay, and you can in sometimes get crazy amounts more, but that's that's a topic for for another time. But if I walk into a property like this one that I got before, it was disgusting. Like I actually called the RSPCA on them because of the way they treat. I'm a big animal lover, and the way they treated their dogs, I was like, I'm not letting this go. This is yeah, this is wrong. But it, it stank. Everything was wrong about it. The the advertising on it. Yeah, let's just say I don't want to give the agent any grief because he's a good dude, uh, really good at what he does. But for what he was told to do from this campaign, because that's the other thing a lot of people don't, I suppose, get get previewed to, is everything always comes back to why the agent do this. I'm not the decision maker when I'm selling a house. No agent is the decision maker when they're selling a house. The vendor is always the decision maker. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sure he would have sat down and said, we should do X, Y, Z. Unfortunately, they chose to do, yeah, one, two, three instead. Now, as soon as I saw that, I saw people walking in, walking out, just going, we don't want this. I'm like, brilliant. Here's an opportunity. Because everyone's scared of it. Realistically, though, this property that I got for 215 tidy it up. And the things that actually, and this was the, the stupid thing as well, I actually even put it in the contract that all personal effects of the tenant needed to be cleared out from the front yard, the backyard, and the internals of the home prior to settlement. And put a pre-settlement inspection in there, did everything that way they were going to clean it out anyway. And it's like, if you had have actually just cleaned this out, got the tenant out, and just did even a tiny little cosmetic reno, realistically, they probably should have got more like 250, 260 for that property. But it's just, it just wasn't there. And if you can look for these things that turn other people off, that turn other buyers off, that's really when you can spot an opportunity. And that's what I look for. That's a very good strategy. And I think, you know, you've identified some of the key areas to look out for. And, and, and yeah, as you say, what you 
telling people to uh, to invest in you, you're looking for the complete opposite because you want to manufacture that, that or not that you're telling them to invest in it, but uh, things to look out for. But you want to actually have, find those areas in the, in the property that you can um, generate some equity out of and, and improve. Is there is there anything that you're doing to sort of say, hey, oh, this is a little bit too risky. Maybe I should hold back and, and not get a 95% LV, LVR on this one or what, what are you doing along the way to sort of manage your risks? Yeah, just de- definitely not doing the, the almost 100% lens like where I started. That that was a, a bit crazy. Um, but on the other side to that is actually just coming back to the, the budgeting. Uh, I'm saving as much money as I can right now and I've just cut everything back. So if, if you can just, like you were saying, moving in um, with family, uh, I've moved in with family as well. And it's, I tell you, it's, it's definitely not to impress the ladies. It's not a, a cool <laughs> thing to say when you're 34 years old, but I'm, I'm looking at, actually, I, I tried to tell this to my now girlfriend, actually, uh, saying I'm, I'm musking it. And she's like, what is musking it? To me, that was like, well, you know, Elon Musk, he had his office and he slept on the floor for like the first two years or whatever it was as he was getting everything started. And she sends me a text message back going, you know, musking it actually means having sex in the back of a Tesla. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm not musking it then. That's not what I'm doing at all. <laughs> but it's, it's, just, <laughs> it's just about sacrificing now. And I think... It's something that a lot of people just don't want to do. But if you can do it, if, if you're prepared to do what other people aren't, then you'll be able to do what other people can't. And, and I think that's, that's really where my mindset is as far as reducing the risk because right now my overheads are so minimal. If anything goes wrong my, and my properties are cash flow positive, like if all of a sudden everything just goes kaput tomorrow, it's like, unless everything just stops, well, then we're all in a whole world of hurt for different reasons. But I, I don't have a lifestyle where it costs me two, $3,000 a week to live. And, and I don't have a portfolio that costs me $500,000, whatever, to keep. So I'd say that's probably more my risk management at the moment. It's not definitely not the sexiest answer. It's not the coolest thing. But for now, I, I think it's going to work. Yeah, I think that's awesome. I think you, 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 it is kind of part of managing your risk because you've still got that cash flow coming in. I mean, obviously, we're seeing uh, rents decline in, in certain markets at the moment, which is a bit scary for some cash flow investors. But I think you, you've diversified enough to, to cover yourself there. And then obviously, you've got you that manufacturer equity part as well. So, you know, worst case scenario, you can just do another renovation and, and sell it off or whatever the, the, the strategy might be there. And I think it's cool to see how you've done that big flip. Like originally you, you bought the apartment to impress a girl and now you've sold sold everything and living with mum and dad to, <laughs> to not impress a girl or to be, um, you know, try and save as much as you possibly can. I, I love that. It's, it's awesome. That's part of the journey and part of the, the learning experience. And I guess, you know, for people that are that are at that young age, and, and that's kind of my target market is the, the younger investors or the younger people trying to get into the property market. You know, we, we've got a, a prime example here of someone who's still implementing delayed gratification. You know, they're still under understanding that fundamentally they're keeping their costs low, but they're, they're managing their risk. They've got the cash flow coming in from the rental properties. Everything's positively or neutrally geared. Plus there's, there's other strategies and ways of, of manufacturing some money as well while, while keeping the, the, uh, expenses low. So I think, you know, it's a, it's a great breakdown, you know, there's, you know, and I've said this before, like there's no point, um, in my life, I think where I'll go, okay, it's time to uh, stop being delayed in my gratification. I'm going to, I'm going to use all the money that I've got. I think, you know, I'll always implement that through my life. And I think you're kind of at that same point now where you're just going to continue to, um, cut costs where you need to. And then, uh, and keep investing as much as you possibly can and being that active investor that you, you so passionately are. Um, and so, I mean, how is the current portfolio looking? Is it, what's the total value? How many properties you got in there? What's your current LVR? Yeah, so three properties at the moment. Um, total value just under 700 grand. So definitely not as much as, as some of the guys you would have got on the, the show before. Um, but at this stage, like I said, it's it's just the growth stage right now because uh, as much as I bought my first property when I was 21, um, it really, it didn't kick off again until like three years ago. So I feel like I'm almost like set back to, to zero with this. But this, then this is exactly why I, I really wanted to do this and, and offer the transparency because I think it's important to also show if you have made a few silly decisions in your, your early 20s, it's not too late to go, actually, you know, I'm going to turn the ship around. And it's just something that at the moment, I'm, I'm quite passionate about the, the growth side. So LVR, I think I'm just sitting just above the, the 80-20. 
Um, so it's, it's not highly, highly leveraged, but it's still reasonably highly like leveraged. I'm not at a 50, 50. Um, so I think I owe yeah, 480 or whatever it is, something along those lines. Um, and it's mainly just about keeping things positively geared at, at this stage and being able to manufacture the growth. Yeah, that's awesome. So, I think that that's part of your, your risk management as well. Like you're actually pretty, uh, got a pretty low LVR there. So you're doing quite well on that front as well. It's not like you're, you're leveraged to the hills and trying to, you know, pay all these expenses down. So, and, 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 you know, humble portfolio, mate, I absolutely love it. There's no, there's no right or wrong, or, you know, you need to have uh, millions of dollars in, in the, in the property portfolio. I mean, obviously we've had a lot of guests on that, that have got there. And I think that kind of deters a lot of other people as well. I said, Oh, we'll never be able to, get $4 million in property, but you know, someone like yourself who uh, is an active, active investor, investor. And, and still generating income in the format that you are, um, you know, it, it, it can be done. You can still have three properties and, and be on your merry way. So um, I'm, I'm very impressed, mate. You're doing pre- pretty good things there, but are there any mistakes that you have made along the journey? Um, yeah, d- doing it probably in, in partnership with, um, uh, with a relationship. So not not partnerships in business partnership, um, and and even mean this with all due respect to, to an ex, but did a, a project with an ex, uh, just the, the last one, and um, realistically, it's mixing the business side of things with the personal side of things, went on the same wavelength, and and it was massive strains on the the relationship or now ex, so obviously big strains, uh, <laughs> other reasons apart from that as well, but but still, it's just if you, you're not on the same wavelength when it comes to what to do how to do it, all that kind of stuff it just makes it so difficult so i really think i'm not saying i'd never go into a partnership again like that but I, i'd be very very careful about about doing that either with a yeah uh, a partner like a girlfriend or even a, a business partner yeah i think that's a really great one and i think a lot of people can potentially get caught up in in that as well and it's all about you know sitting down properly and and walking through and making sure that you are all on the same page before you even think about getting into that and i I think that's a phenomenal piece of advice there mate but i am a massive fan of your podcast and your youtube channel uh pizza and property but what what's the main drive behind the podcast and the youtube channel are you just trying to share your journey on the youtube channel are you trying to uh, talk to ex Experts. I mean, what what are you uh, trying to share with your listeners there, and, and where can people get some more info about it? Well, if you, you just type in pizza and property onto to YouTube, uh, you, you'll find it there, and it's it's probably a little bit of both of what you just said there, Jordan. It's, it's about sharing the journey of, of what I'm doing um, and how things are, are going to be growing, and it's also about making sure that we're we're talking with different experts and sharing that as much as possible because. As an agent, I come into contact with so many different property investors and being able to really like tap into that and go, here you go, here's a platform where we can actually share this with hundreds or thousands of people. It's just an amazing idea. I, like I love it. Like what, what you're doing, what anything, as much knowledge as you can get. I've taken so much from, from so many different podcasts, books, videos, everything. I thought, why not start sharing it myself as well? But the other side of it is I really wanted to make sure that it wasn't about like, sure, I've, I've got a couple of properties, but I don't want to start beating my chest going, oh, I'm amazing at this and like come and do my renovation course. I think there's, there's a few too many people out there like that that have got one or two investment properties. And then all of a sudden it's like, hey, come to my master class. It's like, you're not a master at this. You've, you've done it twice. Like Harry Trigenboff wants to release a master class. I'm signing up in two seconds, okay? But, but otherwise, it's, it's about making sure that the people we're getting on really are professional in their field. But the other contrast to that is just the showing what I'm doing. So showing the mistakes, showing the wins, showing bits of everything. Because like you and I were discussing off air, I mean, I've been toying with this idea of doing a vlog for a little while. I think I'm, yeah, I'm still not 100%. So I'm not saying I'm going to 100% commit to it because I think once you commit to that, that's it. That, that's now life. You, you now do that. And, but I, I do really think it would be interesting because there's lots of people that, we we'll say, hey, this is what I've done. That's awesome. It's really, really good. Not knocking it in any way. But I've never found anyone that said, hey, this is what I'm going to do. Watch me over the next decade. I think that there's something, yeah, there's definitely going to be something to that. So, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I'd be super keen to watch it, mate. Just just so you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. But do you reckon you, do, you wouldn't yes, do a daily, viewer. A daily <laughs> vlog, would you? Or would it be, or would it, how often would you do it, you reckon? 
honestly, I, I wouldn't have the time. Like my, my schedule <laughs> at the moment, I get up at 5 a.m. I go for a run usually for, for half an hour. Then I'm editing videos, podcasts until around sort of 7.30. I'm going into the office. Um, real estate, is, it's so much more work than, than people think. Like I often make jokes saying I just sit at my desk and people just throw me bags of money. It isn't <laughs> quite like that. <laughs> um, but that, that can go to anywhere between, yeah, knocking off at, at 6 or sometimes even 10 o'clock at night. So if it's knocking off at 6, then that's usually when I go, all right, time to go around to the project and, and actually just work on whatever I'm working on at the time. So as far as doing a daily vlog amongst the other content that we're producing at the moment, I don't know how I'd have time to film it, edit it, upload it. It just, it wouldn't fit. So, which is actually yeah. part of the reason I'm even not a hundred percent committed to the weekly side of it. Cause I reckon I'd have to add someone into the team to actually, yeah, actually produce a part of it to really commit. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, you, you could outsource it, but the, the daily, I don't, I don't Yeah. Amongst all the other things that you do, I don't, I don't know how you'd find the time. And especially, you know, as you say, you, people don't really understand how, how much work is in being in a, being a real estate agent. I mean, your, your phone must just be constantly going on. You have to always be on. There's no real, uh, you know, switch off, switch on. You kind of always got to be there ready to go and, and have a conversation. So, um, but no matter how often you do it, mate, I'd love to uh, love to watch it daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. I'm, I'm keen, still loving your, 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 your videos that you put onto YouTube anyway, so, so keep them coming. But is there any sort of final advice that you'd give to the younger generation to get started? Don't, don't be afraid. If you've got that doubt in your mind, it's seriously, the doubt is going to kill more than anything else. Just try, try your best to, to dig a little bit within yourself and find out where that's coming from and just save as much money as you can. So when you, you understand that journey you want to get on, you remove that doubt from why it's not going to happen because it's bollocks. It'll happen for you. Just, just work hard, save your money and, and really hundred percent believe in yourself and, and you can accomplish so much more than, than you think. Like, yeah, it's, it's really as simple as that. I love it, mate. It's, uh, that's very sound advice. Well, Todd, I wanted to thank you so much again for coming on today, mate. It's been uh, really insightful and thank you for being so um, uh, exposing everything and, and uh, being transparent with us and, and, and showing us the journey, talking to us about your mistakes. I think you know, that they're the biggest learnings that anyone will get out of a, of a story. So thanks again, mate. Awesome. Really appreciate it, Jordan. Thanks for having me. Wasn't Todd's story super inspiring? I love his energy and his determination to be the very best that he can be. I also really appreciate Todd coming on and being so transparent with his mistakes and his current portfolio. I'm always looking for more guests to come onto the show. If you're under 30 and have one or more investment properties, whether it's good, bad or ugly, I would love to talk to you about it. Even if you're interested into getting into the property sector, let's have a chat. The main focus is to help other soon to be young investors with tips and tricks along the journey. Learn from the mistakes that we have made and ignite the fire to set themselves up financially for the rest of their lives. If you're interested in sharing your story, you can go to jordandeyong.com forward slash podcast, where there's a podcast inquiry button at the top that will guide you through the next steps. If you want to see what else I'm up to, you can go to YouTube and type in Jordan DeYong, where you'll find the Smash Every Property podcast being hosted on YouTube and plenty of other content that I'm putting out consistently. If you're keen for more content like this, make sure you subscribe and please give us a review with any feedback for future podcasts. And until next time, happy house hunting.